one more time. I just feel this in my heart. Can we just give God just a great, big, humongous, best praise that we can possibly give? I think y'all can do better. God's done some great things for you, hasn't he? Why don't you give the kind of praise that's deserving of a God who does great things, not just small things. He does great things. He's worthy of great praise. Come on, let's celebrate him in this place because he's worthy. He's worthy. Yup, it's going to be like that today, promise you. I love what the Word of God says of itself. Because we could say a lot of things in this room. But the reality is that the Word of God stands forever. The Bible says that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Aren't you thankful for the word of God? Um, I want to get directly into this today, and um, I want to read a passage of scripture that you've probably heard a few times, um, and then we'll get into we'll get into some other things. Matthew four nineteen it says this, and he say, saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, here's a rhetorical question. Um, what, what, what does that verse mean to you? What does that say to you? And um, oftentimes we hear verses like that that we've heard a lot, and it loses its edge to us. So I just want to say some things today along those lines, and we'll get there in just a minute. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the first statement was one of the first statements that Jesus said to some of his followers. The second statement was one of the last statements that Jesus said to his followers. And what I want to point out to you is that bookends on Jesus' life were statements of mission, of being about the Father's business. Jesus was always about the business of building the kingdom of God. So when I say those verses, what goes off on the inside of you? Are you compelled or is it just another verse? When we read verses and we preach the word of God and we say that the word of God stands forever, what goes off in your heart? Anything? Something? Do you feel anything at all? Does it move you? Does it cause something on the inside of you to say, man, I I need to step into that. I feel something out of that. And if not, don't feel bad because it's okay. That, That happens. Sometimes we get in those places where we're not moved, where we don't feel prompted, where we don't feel a push from God. In fact, I want to look at this really crazy phrase. In the scripture this morning, I mean, this is one of the more crazy. You ever read a scripture that you've read over a few times and you hit it one time and you're just like, that is weird. You ever had this? So I'm reading this scripture and I I pass this statement and I'm like, man, that is, that is bizarre. It's weird. So can I share it with you this morning? Do you want to? All right, here we go. So this crazy phrase, it's found in 2 Kings. It's associated with the people of God. It's also associated with a brand new king. Now, just so I can paint the picture as we get into this, this king was King Josiah. He followed two really rotten kings, all right? Two rotten kings that had led Israel into a place of almost desolation, especially spiritually. They were bankrupt spiritually, okay? So Josiah comes into the picture, and when King Josiah takes over, he starts cleaning up the house. And when he starts cleaning the house, he does what God often does. He starts in his house, cleaning the house first. So that's where we pick up the story. And 2 Kings 22, verse 8, it says, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan. Do you see the weird statement in there? I think it's underlined for you. No, it's not. Man, I messed that up. Uh, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. See, I read over that a couple times, and then I was like, well, that's weird. Because another way to say that is, what he's saying is, I found the Bible in church. You know why that's crazy? Because in order for him to have found the Bible in church, it had to be lost. In church. 
know what I'm saying to you today is that it is possible for us to sit in the house of God and the word of God be lost. There's another observation I want to point out. It wasn't that the word of God was not existent anymore. The word of God was still there. The word of God was still going out. The problem was it wasn't being heard. Because sometimes we can listen to the word of God and not hear the word of God. Oh, I'm preaching now. We can sit here week after week after week listening to message after message after message and never hear what God is saying to us specifically. Can anybody identify with that this morning? And that's the place where sometimes our heart can grow cold to the word of God because we're not hearing what God is trying to say to us through the word of God. The word of God is always speaking. It's just a matter of if we're willing to listen to what it says and apply it. But oftentimes we're not willing to A, listen, and then B, apply. Because it's all about listening and obeying, isn't it? And there's a whole list of reasons why we could get into that we sometimes don't listen or hear the word of God. I'm not going to get into a huge list of them, but I just want to point out a few. Is that okay? Can we point out a few reasons that we might not hear the word of God this morning? New Life, are you with me? Yes. Number one is this. Sometimes we feel guilty. Sometimes we feel guilty. If we listen... Something will make us feel bad. What I want to remind you this morning is the word of God is not to make you feel bad. It's to compel you to good works in God. The word of God is not to make you feel bad. But here's the thing. We often feel bad because the enemy helps us to change the narrative. And we get our focus on what we do instead of whose we are. And if we can start focusing on what we do instead of whose we are, we don't want to hear anything that the word of God has to say because I will go ahead and inform you that what you do is not good enough. What you do will never be good enough. The Bible says that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. We will never be good enough to please God by what we do. But we will always be good enough to please God by who we are. Because he died for us just as we were in the wretched state that we were in. And he still loves us today because of who we are, not what we do. Don't let the enemy guilt you into not listening to the word of God because of what you've done. Remember who you are and whose you are. And because of whose you are, Jesus has already changed the narrative. It's not about what you've done. It's about what he's done that's given you a brand new identity today. You are alive in Christ, a brand new creature. The old is gone and the new has come. And it's a new day in him. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Sometimes we're distracted. Sometimes we're distracted. How many of you know that life can get busy? And when life gets busy, sometimes it's hard to hear what God's saying to us because we don't want to slow down. We got stuff going on and it's around us and we got things to do. We got to accomplish this and accomplish that. Everything is going on and it's hard to take a moment and just pause and say, God, where are you in all of this? Anybody guilty of that? I'm I'm guilty this morning. That's that's this guy right here. Sometimes life gets in the way of the mission. But remember that Jesus always came back to the mission. He was our living example, wasn't he? If you remember, all the way back to 14 years old, Jesus teaching the scribes and Pharisees on the steps of the temple. And his mother came back to get him. And what did Jesus respond to her? I must be about my father's business. He was always on mission never stopped look all the way fast forward to the end of his life he's hanging on the cross being punished and tortured for sins that weren't even his and what did jesus do in the final moments in the final breaths some of the last words he said father forgive them they know not what they do he was on mission can i remind you it doesn't matter what you're facing you're not facing crucifixion today no matter how difficult your situation is that you're going through be on mission Remember that this thing is more important than whatever it is that you've got to do. This thing that we have in front of us, this treasure that we have, this story that we have to tell is way more important than whatever it is that we're facing in life. Amen. I needed an amen on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sometimes we need to fix our face.
Does anybody know where I'm going with this one? Because sometimes we just got a rotten attitude. And we don't hear God because we don't want to. Anybody been there before? I don't want to hear anything God's got to say because I really don't care. I don't feel like it. Don't want to hear it. Got other stuff that's more important. I don't want to talk about it. Has anybody ever been there before? It's okay. You can admit it. I've been there before. We get in a place where we have a rotten attitude. Our focus gets shifted onto things that don't really matter. And then the things that do matter get shifted aside and our attitude gets ugly and we need to fix our face. I'm going to take that a step further because sometimes when our attitude is really rotten, it's really rotten because we've gotten our attention and our focus off of Jesus and onto everybody else. And listen, everybody else will always disappoint you. They will always frustrate you. They will never make you happy. So instead of pointing at them and being frustrated with them, why don't you go take a look in the mirror and say, this guy right here needs to get his heart aligned with God so he can hear what thus saith the Lord, not what everybody else is worried about or not doing or doing how they shouldn't do. Focus on God. Last one is this. Sometimes we simply don't believe God is talking to or wants to talk to us. Sometimes we're convinced in our heart that we're not good enough, that God would never use us. There's all kinds of other people in this church that God would want to use. He would never want to talk to me. Can I tell you that's a lie right straight out of the pit of hell? It's, that's a lie. It's a lie. Not only does God love you, he loves you enough that he would have went to the cross for you alone because what God had in his heart was relationship with people. People matter to God. You matter to God. No matter how insignificant at times you may feel, remember that you were worth the cross to Jesus. You were worth the son of God to God. You are worth something. Don't ever discount yourself and think that you're inadequate. You matter to God. Somebody smile real big. Say, Jesus loves me. Yeah. Red and yellow, black and white. They are all precious in his sight. Do you really believe that this morning? Amen. So what is God really saying to us when we read these verses? Again, Matthew 28, 18, 19, and Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's he saying to us when we read, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men? What is Jesus really speaking to us? Is that just another verse, or is there really something in there that we need to get a hold of? Because I, I confidently believe that there's something more than just some words on a page. It really does matter to Jesus because people really do matter to Jesus. And the way that Jesus has decided to reach people is through his people, the local church. That's you and me. We're supposed to be fishers of men. So much so that Jesus' life and ministry was bookended by statements about the mission. Come on, somebody say amen. Give me just a second. Give me just a second, all right? Because I get today to use one of my very favorite props I've ever used in a sermon. We gone fishing. I love this thing. If anybody in this room has a bass boat and feels a supernatural unction right now to invite me to go fishing, I'm with you. You are my people, I am with you, amen. Okay, I love fishing. No, I just wanna draw some parallels with this statement because Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And sometimes we see the obvious and we really don't see what's right in front of us. Fishers of men. And there's some important things when you go fishing, right? You, you can have this nice rod and reel. And, and if you have a nice rod and reel and you have a boat and you go out and you sit on the boat and you're sitting there all day long, but you never put bait on the line, you're not going to catch many fish. So I need bait. Write that down this morning. I need bait. You need bait. In order to be a fisher of men, you have to have bait. What's the bait? What draws people? What brings people? Look at John 6, 44. It says, no one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. What does that mean for us? 
Can I tell you this? It means if we're not connected to the Father, then we don't have any bait to offer anybody. We have to stay in a place where we're connected to and hearing from God or we've lost our bait. The Bible says it in some other places like this. What if a salt loses its savor? It's worth nothing but to be trampled under the feet of men. What good is a light when it's placed under a basket, right? But no, nobody does that. They put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all the world around it. Understand this, that when we're not connected to the source, we have no bait on the end of the line and we're not catching any fish. Number two, write this one down. If I don't cast, I'll never catch. It seems pretty simple that if we go out on the lake and we sit on the nice pretty boat, you can have the prettiest boat and the nicest gear in the world. But if you never cast, you will never catch fish. Can I tell you this morning that I believe we have the greatest church ever. I love our church. It's incredible. Thank you for that one little golf clap over there in the side. Thank you for that. Our church is absolutely incredible. And our God is absolutely amazing. There is no God like our God. We have incredible things that happen here week after week after week. God does amazing things. But listen, if we never cast, we'll never catch. You know how we cast? We invite. If we're not inviting, we're not casting. And if we're not casting, we're not catching. Oh, I'm preaching right now. Is there anybody in this room this morning that will say, I can't remember the last time that I invited somebody. That's like being on the pretty boat and sitting with a nice rod and reel, but never casting the line. You're not catching anybody. You're just sitting. You're just out for a nice day on the lake. Can I encourage you this morning that until we start to cast... Life change cannot happen through you. God will use you individually the way he wants to use you when you begin to cast. You know what's interesting about casting? You don't catch a fish every single time you cast. But you don't stop casting. I'm going to say that again. Because it's really important for you to understand that you may not catch the fish every single time you cast the line. Every time you invite They may not show up, but that's okay. Don't quit casting because it might be the very next cast that you bring a big one in. That life change really does happen through you just being willing to cast. I was going to throw this thing, but I better better not. I might whack somebody in the eye with it. We did take the hooks off, so it's safe, Dalton, if I get close to you. We won't get you. That would be a big fish. Maybe Brian, put those hooks back on. Um, See what that's like. Uh, Number three is this. Actually, hold on. Let me pause. Let me read a a scripture real quick. Romans 10, 14. It says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Just going to let that one sit for a minute. Who are we telling about the good news of God? Number three, I need a story. I need a story. You know, fishermen are known by their stories. Come on. Does anybody have a fishing story? You don't have to tell it right now, but has anybody got a fishing story? Like fishing stories are interesting, right? Because fishing stories are never the whole truth and nothing but the truth. They're a little, a little extra. As my mother used to say, that's stretching the truth, right? That's, that fish was, right? We know that. But we need to have a story to tell. And for some of us, we feel like we don't have a story because we're looking at our life and it just doesn't feel like that would move anybody. Can I tell you that we still have the greatest story that has ever been told? I'm about to preach right now, so you're just going to have to give me a little bit of a break. There is no better story than John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. There is no better story. 
What other story do you need? Don't worry about your imperfections and somebody finding out that you're not good enough. Because I will tell you this, they're not good enough either. And what they need to know is that Jesus loves them in their condition, in the state that they're in. And the good news of the gospel applies to them just like it does to you. Your imperfection is a good thing. It puts you in a place where you need Jesus. Look how Paul told that story. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Somebody say, ministry of reconciliation. That's good. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, as he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We have a great story to tell. The great news of the gospel is this, that your sin is not counted against you because of the goodness of Jesus on the cross. In fact, Jesus has exchanged what we have done for what he has done and has given us an opportunity to accept a new identity and new life in him. I'm going to say that again because it was real good and I feel like that y'all should be responding better than y'all right now. So we're going to try that again, okay? Because of Jesus and who he is, he has exchanged what we have done for what he has done and has given us an opportunity to accept new identity and new life in him. Somebody say amen. You have the ministry of reconciliation, of making things right with God. You have that ministry. What an exciting opportunity it is to tell people the good news that they can be right with God, not because of what they've done, but because of what Jesus has done. So why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why can't we just get the good news for ourselves and go off into the sweet by and by on our own? Because people matter to Jesus. People matter to Jesus. And Jesus has selected his people, the church, to do his ministry of connecting people to God. I'm going to give you three thoughts, and I'm I'm, I'm going to plow through this pretty quick because I want to get to some other things at the end here. But number one is this. Jesus was all about people because he knew the heart of his father. From the beginning of time, when God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden... God longed for relationship and fellowship with man. Read your Bible, it's in there, I promise. So what God has always intended was for us to be in connection and relationship with him. When that relationship is severed, God has already proven that he will stop at nothing to make sure that there is a connection between us and and him. Why? Because God loves us. And because God loves us, Jesus loves us. And because Jesus loves us, the church should love people. Number two is this. Jesus was all about people because he knew the reality of eternity. I wonder if our efforts of the ministry of reconciliation would look different if we really had a view of eternity and how it impacts people. Jesus was keenly aware of what eternity separated from God means. I wonder today if it shouldn't trouble our heart more than it does that we have friends and loved ones 
and co-workers, family members who right now do not have a promise of eternity with God. And there's a very real chance that they're going to spend eternity separated from God. Should that not move us to action? Because it sure did Jesus. Captivated every part of him because he had a reality about eternity. I just want to remind us to never get real far from the reality of eternity. Not to strike fear in people's heart, but that it motivates us to be active in the will and the participation of the ministry of reconciliation. It should motivate us. If it doesn't, we probably need a reality check. Amen? Man, that's heavy. That's a lot. All right, let's move on. Jesus was all about people because he knew the potential of people. Jesus looked at people and realized that with their giftings and talents and abilities connected with his power, that they could change the world. You know what's ridiculous is there's people all around us that have gifts and talents and abilities that if they would put them to work in the ministry of reconciliation, lives would be changed all over the place. It would be radical what would take place. Can I tell you today that the world that we live in is in desperate, desperate and dire need of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? The news gets worse and worse, doesn't it? The moral plight of people in our country, it looks worse and worse, doesn't it? But can I tell you that it doesn't mean that we're destitute. It doesn't mean that we're hopeless. It means that this is the greatest opportunity that's ever been put in front of the church to tell people that Jesus is all that they need. They'll never find happiness in all the other things that they're looking for. Politicians can't fix what's going on. No rights, no marches, none of that stuff will change it. Nothing will change what we're going through until we come in contact with the Savior of the world. What is missing in the hearts of men is Jesus and Him alone. And that ministry falls on the church. It's not anybody else's job. It doesn't matter what president's in office and if he's rooting for the church or rooting against the church. Listen, it is on the church to stand up and make the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel known to all the world. I want to leave you with some practical steps this morning for sharing your faith because oftentimes sharing our faith for some of us feels like a death sentence <laughs> what in the world can't do that for some of us it feels like banging on doors and throwing bibles in people's faces it's neither of those things not what God had in mind can I tell you three things that it is will you hang with me are we are we okay right now man we're doing good we're rolling we're rolling number one is this all right this one's really going to shake you to the core are you ready talk to people I don't think that I've ever had more practical points to end a sermon with than what I'm going to end this one today talk to people you ready you ready for some of you you get like in hyperventilation mode over that like what, 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 wait a minute wait listen it's not that hard starts like this <laughs> start a conversation it's really not that difficult ask a question you know, it's easy for me to talk to anybody. My wife will tell you that. I can talk to anybody. I don't have a problem talking to people. It's just easy. I'm not bragging. I'm not being pompous in that. You know why? Because I have a secret. You know what my secret is? I know everybody's favorite subject. That's right. Y'all know it. You're your own favorite subject. I was talking to a guy the other day, and you know what? All I wanted to do was tell him about my kids and how cute they are. 
That's all I wanted to do. But I couldn't get him to shut up. He was telling me about his kids. And all he wanted to do was rattle on about his kids because he is his own favorite subject. He was telling his story about him and his kids. And I wanted to tell him about me and my kids. It's really not that difficult to have a conversation. Ask somebody a question. Just have a simple conversation. Jesus did that, didn't he? He did, I promise. It wasn't a trick question. Um, <laughs> Jesus did it everywhere he went. In John 4, 7, it says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. I've always found this story interesting because um, sometimes if you tell a woman that you've never met before to get you a drink, she'd be like, well, get your own drink. <laughs> I'm just saying. And the reality is Jesus could have gotten his own drink. There was nothing wrong with Jesus. He could have. In fact, if Jesus wanted to, I mean, he could have went all Messiah and commanded the rocks to pour out water in that moment. But you know what Jesus was doing? He was starting a conversation. We've made it really profound. Oh, he's uh, the water, it's something special. It's, this is that special. It's not special. And Jesus just wanted to talk to her about living water. And that's what he did. He started a conversation. For a lot of us, we've made witnessing and, and talking to people so complicated. It's really not that complicated. Just talk to people. Just start a conversation. Open a door for somebody. Smile at somebody. It's okay. It's not weird, I promise. Number two is this. Invite people. Again, earth-shattering news. Crazy point. Invite people. You know what? Jesus invited people. He invited people. Check out this scripture in John 1, verses 36 through 39. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak. They followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Where are you going? And he said to them, Come and see. He invited them. Jesus invited them to just come and see. It wasn't a profound thing. It was very simple. Come and see. You know, when somebody asks you about your church, you don't have to get into profound details. We're this theology and that theology and the pastor preaches like this and the worship's like this and we do have lights, we don't have lights, we do this, we don't do that. No, just say, come and see. Just, just come and see, come check it out. It's better, it's better seen than told, right? Just, just come and see. John 1, verses 40 to 42, one of them which heard John speak and followed him and was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. You know what he did? He went and found his closest relative and he said, come and see. He invited him. For some of you in this room, you're like waiting on this moment where you're going to meet that person that God wants you to invite. Right? Am I talking to anybody today? I mean, I know it's kind of funny, but it's really, it's true. We wait on this mystical moment where we're going to have this revelation from God, where we're supposed to pontificate the eschatology and the soteriology of the gospel of Jesus to someone and lead them to the Lord. And listen, it's not about that. It's simple. Just come and see. Just come and see. Is that good? Can I ask you this morning, how many people in this room, how many people in this room would say that in some way, shape, or form, God has changed your life here at New Life Chapel? If God has changed your life in this place, why would you ever withhold that from anybody? 
not just the person that you might come in contact with, but the people that are closest to you. Why would you ever want them to miss out on what happens in this place? God wants to do incredible things in their life. But guess what? It requires that we cast because we're not catching if we're not casting. Are you inviting? Have you invited somebody to come and be beside you and hear the good news and experience what God does in this place week after week after week? I mean, are you kidding me? Our pastor preaches unbelievable week after I mean he preaches the paint off the walls I'm ready to get saved every week you kidding me it's good stuff and why would you ever want somebody to miss that we're getting ready to go into a brand new series all right I'm gonna drop some things on you because we're getting ready to enter into one of the most exciting times of the year here at New Life Chapel I love this season of the year at New Life because God just he blows my mind every year through this season And there's some great things that are getting ready to happen. We're launching into a brand new series next week, The God I Never Knew. I guarantee you, you have people in your life that want to know about this topic. It's the topic of the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does. It's not weird, I promise. You can tell them that. Tell them that. We said, it's not weird. Come check it out. Come and see. All right? Invite somebody to come and see. Another thing that we're doing, we got 21 days of prayer that we're launching. That's next week. It's incredible when the body of Christ begins to pray and seek God together. We're also giving you an opportunity to not only participate in that, but you can go right on our website and click, and there's a place right in there where you can put your prayer request in there and know that our team is praying for your needs with you, that God is going to do something incredible in and through you. It's an exciting season to be part of this church. We're not that far off from connect groups. They're getting ready to start. When connect groups start, you can get connected in this church and feel like you're really a part of something that is bigger than you. Our students meet every single week. If you have students in your family, they need to be connected in this life-changing, life-giving ministry that goes on every single week. Listen, high school and college students, I don't know if you know this or not, they are being radically impacted every single week. Do you not want the students in your life to experience that? Why would you ever want them to miss it? You've got nephews and nieces and people in your life that need to be here and be part of it. Invite them. What are you waiting on? Tell them to come and see. Maybe you've invited before. Remember, you don't catch every single time you cast. There's a Gallup poll out. This is not a church statistic. All right, this is a Gallup poll. Six out of 10 people say that they would go to church if they were only invited. feel like that has implications on the church I feel like that says something about our efforts to cast the last one is this witness to people take the religiousness out of witnessing okay it's you don't have to get all King James on somebody thus saith the Lord you should thou thus You don't have to do that. You don't have to be loud. You don't have to get demonstrative. You know what witnessing is? It's telling your story. If you've ever seen a court case, when they call a witness, they don't call a witness to come and tell what they think. They call a witness to come and tell what they saw. Can I invite you today to just be a witness of what God has done in you what has God done in your life and is that story not worth sharing with somebody is that story not worth sharing with everybody if you don't feel good about that story can I urge you that if you'll lean into Jesus he'll do something so significant in your life that it will give you a story that you can tell people because that's just the God that we serve he is incredible When you come in contact with him, your life is never the same. Check out these last verses. John 3.32, it says, 
and what he hath seen and heard, he testified, that he testified. That was Jesus. Here's a passage about the disciples in the book of Acts. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. This last passage is about Paul, the greatest apostle who ever lived. You are to be his witnesses telling everyone what you have seen and heard. I want to encourage you today to come in contact with Jesus and get an experience so that you can go tell people what you've seen and heard. If it's not that personal to you, I can tell you this. You can tell them what's happening here. That hundreds of people have come to know who Jesus is. That thousands of dollars have been given to missions. That life change is happening all over the world. Seriously, if you need a story to tell, ask somebody on our team. And we'll tell you all kinds of things that you can tell people. Borrow a story if you have to. This is the good news and it's worth sharing with the world. Go tell what you've seen and heard. I want to share a story with you in my last few seconds here. And I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm going to hold myself together on this one, okay, I promise. This. There's a really inspirational figure in my life. It was my uncle, my uncle Ken. And he pastored for 39 years, a little tiny country church on the edge of the town that I grew up in. I have no idea how many stories of life change come out of that little tiny church out on the side of the road. Literally, thousands of people have passed through that little bitty place. Lots of decisions for Christ have been made. But that's not the story I want to tell you today. The mission of Jesus has to matter to us in a big way. I remember at the end of my uncle's life, he had really deteriorated in his health and he was on dialysis and he was, it, it was getting really bad. And my dad went in to visit him and when he walked in, my uncle was sitting up in the bed. And it was huge because for a while he was, he was just kind of out of it, he just not doing well at all. But this particular day, my dad walked in and he's sitting up straight up in the bed. And he told my dad, he said, I've been up praying all night. He said, I'm done with dialysis, I'm not doing it anymore it done and he said I know what that means for me but I need you to do something for me I've got a list of people I want you to call them and I want them to come to see me my uncle sat in that bed for the last day and a half of his life while like a rotating door people came through to see him and he on his deathbed witnessed to them and told them how they needed to get this decision right that it was one chance that they had to face eternity and know that they had hope in the next life. That's finishing well. It mattered. And it matters. And today, I want you to know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is that good of a story. And it should be the last thing on our mind. It should be the last thought that passes through our mind. So I wonder today if while we, some of us, have a lot of life in front of us, do we feel proud of how we're spending the days that we have and this little bit of time that we have on earth to make a difference? Do we, are we feeling like we're doing what God really called us to do? Do you feel good about where you're at and what you're doing And if not, this isn't a message of condemnation. This is not a message. Do not mistake what I'm saying. This is to prod you on to good works in Jesus. You have an opportunity today to go out and make a difference. You have the best story that could ever be told. And it does make a difference in people's lives. And there are people that you will face today that desperately need to know who Jesus is. And what are we doing with the time that we have available? Jesus is still the hope of the world. 
The story of Jesus is still the best news that's ever been told. For some of us in this room today, we may not even know who Jesus is. This whole witnessing thing is like, what in the world? What did I get into? What's this guy even talking about today? Fishing for men, that's weird. Can I tell you one time you come in contact with Jesus, you'll leave here and you'll never be the same. You can find out what we're talking about today and you can leave here different than you walked in. So I'm gonna take a moment and I'm I'm just gonna invite you that if you've never prayed a prayer of salvation, I'm gonna invite you to pray that prayer today. You can leave here knowing that you have eternal hope in Jesus Christ and promise of tomorrow. For some of you, you walked in without that hope, but you can leave with it. For some of you, you, have, you feel like you don't have purpose in your life and you wanna leave here with purpose. And I, we'll, we'll get into that later. I, I'll pray for that in just a moment. But if you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is as your personal savior, I'm gonna give you this moment to invite Jesus to come and be the Lord of your life. He will change you forever and he will give you a story worth telling. I'm gonna pray this prayer. I want you all to pray it with me. Lord Jesus, I'm in need of a savior and I want you to be my savior. I ask you today to forgive me of all of my sins, to make me new in Jesus. I declare today because of this decision, the old has gone and new life has come. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you just prayed that prayer, I want you to shoot your hand up and say, Preacher, I just prayed that prayer. I just made that decision to follow Jesus as my personal Savior. Go ahead and stand with me all over this room this morning. I wanna just pray over us quickly and then we're gonna transition on to the next part of the service. But does anybody feel like God just really spoke something into your spirit today through that message? Do you feel urged to good works? I, I hope that, and I wanna pray for us real quick. God, we give you thanks for what you've spoken into our hearts and into our lives. God, it's in this moment, at this time, I pray for people in this room, God, that maybe they do Maybe they are struggling with feelings of inadequacy. Maybe they don't feel like, God, that you're speaking directly to them in this room today or they're excusing it to be someone else. God, I pray that you would just solidify that right now by just letting them know your nearness. That we wouldn't walk out of here without knowing, God, that you have called us individually to do something incredible for you and that you wanna change lives through us. We thank you for that. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray, amen.